Greetings and welcome back to another discussion. Today I'm very pleased and privileged to bring you that guy, Pete. You refuse to invite to gatherings. A legend in his own right has an amazing channel. You might know him by his many titles, the Lord of Ireland, Slayer of Tax Dragons, Baron of Brooklyn. And in case you don't know him, I'm going to ask him as the very first question, what his channel is about, what he talks about, what's its intention, etc., etc. So without further ado, the most magnificent Pete, Baron of Brooklyn. Yeah, um, good to be here. Um, you know, I uh, just wanted to say, start off, thanks for having me. Um, you know, this is a good opportunity. And um, I hope that those who are listening um, value our insights that we share during this conversation. So, yeah, as you said, my channel's name is That Guy Pete. You refuse to invite to gatherings. I mean, at the core, uh, my channel is a Manosphere channel. I don't think I've ever hidden that from anyone. But there's a bit of a twist to it. And I guess the twist is the the thirst for knowledge has no bounds on my channel. You name it, I try to explore it. I actively seek out viewpoints that oppose us and try to dissect them and make sense of them. And I tend to do this via a whiteboard, though I don't always use that. Uh, some people have jokingly referred to me as a professor and they feel like class is in session and things like this. But I guess maybe the best way to explain my channel just is just to give you an overview of like, well, what are you looking at when you click on it? So basically what I do is I organize my information into playlists. So depending on what resonates with you, you can go to that playlist and ignore the rest and just watch that content. And that's kind of how I have it set up. So I have a playlist, for example, for Red Pill, which I kind of look at as more psychological stuff. Black Pill, which is more physical stuff. Though we do dive into like, you know, um, neurological stuff a little bit in that space. Um, we have White Pill, which is more like, okay, you've accepted the information of Red and Black. What are you gonna do about it? Here's some ideas, that's the White Pill. But if you want something a little more, um, you know, personal i have a who is that guy pete so you can kind of see what my experience is in life and then you know you could decide hey based on what i've learned about this guy i think he's worth listening to i don't think he's worth listening to he doesn't know what he's talking about whatever the point is i give you all this information you decide what you want to do with it and at the end of the day the primary purpose of this channel is to stop men from self-deleting that's really what it's about because um i was watching the red pill documentary with cassie J. I was listening to this story about this guy. He lost his whole family through divorce and he just went out to the middle of the desert and like, that was it. Yeah. And I was just like, that is so horrible. That is such a horrible reason to, to just go and do that. And I was just like, all right, no, I got, I got to say something about this. And that was kind of the genesis of it. And then I just kept going from there. I mean, on the whiteboard, uh, quite retro, but a great idea, immaculate handwriting. I, I think that what you do with the whiteboard is, uh, I mean, it's certainly pretty unique uh, in this day and age. Very few people do that, and it does remind me of uh, you know, lessons from uh, back in the day. But I, I guess everyone, the one question I kind of have to ask you is, you have this, name of your channel is this rather long name, that guy Pete, you refuse to write the <laughs> gatherings. Presumably, you've actually never been invited, I mean, I'm assuming this is true, never been invited to a party, never been invited to an outing, never been invited to a barbecue that's actually true or is that just a kind of meme you come up with so that's kind of a meme i come up with okay. so I, I guess maybe we can get into this later but in my 20s i mean listen you know i went out i went to bars i drank i spent time with people i did what most i guess what you would say neurotypical people do uh which maybe we can define those terms later on um but most of you, you listening probably know what i mean when i say that now that being said I am what you would call more neurologically divergent. That isn't that like that like you know I'm socially awkward or anything like that. I can hold a conversation. It's just the things that I talk about are not the types of things that you talk about at gatherings, right? So you talk about things like you know sports. You talk about Netflix shows. This is what people talk about. Then you got me walking in talking about space exploration, and it's like that meme where everyone's kind of looking at you like this face, like Ugh, who's this guy? Who invited him? And then, you know, they say, hey, don't don't invite him next time. And that's kind of been the running joke because I've had a lot of experiences where I have these deep conversations, even being fully inebriated, I can kind of like keep up. And people were just like, yeah, no, I'm not feeling this conversation. So it's like, yeah, I'm basically a wallflower. 
But um, the reason I'm that guy, Pete, you refuse to invite to gatherings is because no matter how many of these gatherings I went to, never really felt like I belonged. So that's like the core of it. But I also just thought it was funny. Yeah, this is almost in a sense sort of voluntary because you don't get much out of the gatherings. The other people don't get much out of your presence because of the kinds of topics you like to broach. And so it's sort of mutually beneficial in a certain way, one could say, for you not to go to these gatherings. You might as well not even be there. Correct. Yeah. I think that's not too, uh, too uncommon. I, I, it's hard. I, I'm not very neurotypical myself, but I, I think I'd imagine that even very neurotypical individuals uh, struggle with just maintaining a small talk. You know, there, there's only so much of that you can do. I mean, sure, some people are better at it than others and, and probably enjoy it more than others, but I I don't personally find it very satisfac uh, satisfactory. And so I just... I haven't been to a gathering in years. I'm a fair bit older than you, but yeah. So I can totally relate from back in the day. It yeah. just yeah, didn't I, really I, think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even like with small talk, though, I have found that at least like, you know, again, if you want to like divide this along, you know, gender lines, um, with men, like it's a little bit easier to have small talk because the probability that they like the small stuff that you like um, is going to be higher, right? You go, you yep. talk to girls, they start talking about, you know, serial killer documentaries and reality TV shows. And I'm kind of sitting here like, well, I don't really watch any of that stuff. So how, how can I relate to you? But then, you know, I talk to, 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 you know, to one of my friends that's a guy and it's like, yeah, he could talk about Halo. Yeah. He could talk about the matrix. He could talk about mass effect. He could talk about these things. And it's like, oh, okay. We got something to talk about. And it's like, okay, you would consider that small stuff, but you know, again, and no potential sexual tension as well. That definitely makes it easier. Oh, that takes the pressure off for sure. Yeah, you don't have to worry about HR complaints when you're talking with one of your fellow men. Correct. Exactly. So this is, that's a I mean, people, especially these days, I, I don't think you can really underestimate it. Whatever your intentions, I mean, you might have zero interest in said female. Maybe you're just making conversation just to be social and you're at a gathering, for example. I mean, it, it's there's some risk involved, right? Because if a female even thinks that you have some interest and in, you are quote-unquote creepy, i.e., you're not attractive enough in most of the cases, um, then yeah, that that's, you can be socially stigmatized and, and who knows, uh, rumors could be started all sorts of, I mean, I've, I've, I've witnessed personally and I've seen all sorts of strange things happen just because of situations like that. And so yeah. that is probably the biggest factor why it's just easier to talk to guys because there's virtually no risk of that. Correct. Yeah. That, that's a part of it as well. No. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the Red Pill document, which is you know, a couple of years old. Uh, this was, I forgot when it was released, 2017, 16, 15, a long time ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, you mentioned what happened, this guy who decides to you know, go to the desert and just kind of end it all. And it's not so much a point of contention, but something that you bring up frequently in your videos that I thought we could discuss at a little bit of length. Okay. Is that you, what you often cite is sort of the libido gap being the primary divider between men and women, whereas I think that's certainly part of it, but I don't think it's the, the biggest part of it. Have you ever heard the term male mother need uh, before? I have. Um, is that, is that, I'm again, but I'm maybe a little bit fuzzy on the details. Well, I'll just to give it, so, so I'm pretty sure Barbarossa, the late great, in YouTube terms, I'm sure he's out there somewhere, but anyway, probably the first... Well, he was the first MGTOW content channel, Barbarossa. His stuff was, was and remains quite amazing. Um, but at the time, it was, you could argue, revolutionary and just insightful. We're talking, you know, 12 years ago in some cases, 13 years ago. Yeah. Um, but he came up with this term, male mother need. And it's meant to sort of encapsulate this desire a lot of men have for that sort of nurturing, comforting relationship with a female that's typically only administered uh, by by a mother because you know who let's let's be honest women have no mercy uh, unless they're genetically related to you typically and certainly and mothers and are the ones then. pardon and me even then I'm, and even and then even yes then. Yeah, yeah yeah absolutely and even then <laughs> not I, always guaranteed the apps, well yeah I, I know from first-hand experience but so but but in, in, so that's where it sort of encapsulates and i think that we have i mean there's so much evidence to point to you know it's not a scientific term obviously but i think it it describes it pretty well this deep-seated need that a lot of men have 
to you know bond in and, and receive that sort of nurturing comforting attention the problem with it fundamentally is it doesn't again as you pointed out it's not always the case with related females that they're going to give you that um not even your mother but chances are a lot higher but obviously outside of the familial context a, a woman is there to evaluate you you're i mean from the second she puts her eyes on you you're being evaluated now most of the time you're going to you know follow through the, the you're not going to pass the evaluation but that's just really, she's not there to you know dole out mercy or comfort or whatever um and i think the evidence for this and why this is an even more important factor in, in a lot of men's lives than simply the libido issue which is you know, men have a higher libido there's no doubt on average at least is um, evidence, as you brought up, the guy who self-deleted in this document, the, the fact that this has been, you know, well studied and documented, and the event of divorce, where there's a loss of assets, and more importantly, children, or la- loss of access to children, rather, uh, the the amount of self-deletion in terms of men, it, it just rises precipitously, and women just stays, stays flat. Then, you can look at the, the new cottage industry that really started taking off two or three years ago, but it's been around for a little bit. And that's things like OnlyFans or what have you. You know, porn, sorry, prawn. Prawn serves a certain uh, need, obviously. But obvi- but on the other hand, or the other side of the coin, I think we know that OnlyFans is, is servicing something else. And I think a lot of it goes to that pay attention to me, show me attention, you know, that nurturing side, which is obviously all fake in, in that context, but nonetheless, it's it's kind of calling to certain types of men. Um, and I think these guys who are craving relationships, sure, they want to get their rocks off, I bet. But yes. that's only part of it, and probably, uh, I would argue, a smaller aspect than this. However you want to phrase it, I use the male mother need terms is because it I think it encapsulates a lot of it pretty well. It's not scientific, never claimed it was. And yeah. I think that that is, because, so, I mean, let, let's think, anyway, if, and here's one more point here. If, in fact, it were simply a libido, I'm not saying that's your claim, it's just you often say because of the libido gap. I know you're a, a deep thinker on these matters, so you're not limiting it to that, but nonetheless, then, I mean, geez, all these guys could simply, they could, you know, save some money, hire escorts, um, beating it off to, uh, you know, X hamster or whatever would be sufficient, right? Because, you know, it's just the libido gap, knock it out, get on with your day. And yet there's this craving that goes beyond that. Um, never mind the validation factors. So, you know, it's, unfortunately, men on average seem to have this need, which is why you have women making thousands upon thousands a month just for existing and presenting themselves in right. certain ways. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, the whole time you were going through this, I was smiling because I was like, yes, he's hitting the points perfectly. Yes. So we, we in your one of your more recent videos, like I even replied to your comment. Yeah. You said yeah. It, goes, it goes deeper than the libido gap. And I was like, he's talking about companionship. Of course. Like, what what else could it be? Because, um, yeah, one of the things I talk about on the channel all the time is this idea, like, and women, they I, they try to understand it, but I, I tell them, like, you know, it's it's different for men. Like women, what they tend to do is like the act itself, the physical act, it tends to be kind of intertwined with their emotions, right? While for us, we can kind of separate it. This is why you could have a guy like me who has, you know, a prawn addiction since like the age of 15, right? Mm. And the, the libido part is being kept in check. That's fine. Yet the desire for companionship still exists. This male mother need. If can you I add a point to that, uh, Pete, if I may? Yeah. So, you know, nurture versus nature, I mean, it's not a this, this sort of dichotomy or diametric opposites. You can't really disentangle the two. All that said, um, it's probably der- derivative of biology, ultimately. One of the reasons why women don't, because I do think this is a question of sort of scarcity in some sense, that women just have more human companionship in general. One of the reasons cited, for example, in the case of divorce, is a lot of the women they're fine because they have their siblings, their family, they have the friends. And so they have a support system, right? Whereas oftentimes the men in these situations have been sometimes systematically uh, <laughs> separated from their uh, social support systems. It actually is not too uncommon, but nonetheless, it, it's the tendency. They get kind of bogged down in family life and everything tends to wither away. And so right. 
I think that's that's also part of it because I think companionship is kind of a human need on average, at least. Some people are different, um, but women have that service by multiple types. I mean, it's not ex ident obviously hanging out with a girlfriend for a female isn't the same thing as a male, or hanging out with yeah. your brothers yeah. and sisters. But right. it's still it, women are, are just have more access to that on average, and so the need for that as a consequence, in addition to having a lower libido, is just less. That's why I think they they wield so much power, social power over men. Just want to add that. Correct. Yeah, one of the one of the ideas, and you know, I'll tell you the truth. Listen, if you're a self-disciplined man, yes, technically you're the gatekeeper of relationships because you've mastered your own libido and all that stuff. Most men have not. So the reality is that, yeah, women are the gatekeepers of the act, but we might as well have handed the key to the relationship to women on a silver platter. That's true. But I would say that, um, you know, looking at this in the abstract, as I said, no, I agree with you that, you know, this male mother need and, and kind of like what I tend to talk about is companionship. That's it's kind of synonymous. And I would say that overall, yeah, I agree with you for sure that it's not just the libido gap. But what I will tell you is at the end of the day, what's the first thing that drives a man, right? It's his libido. That's so very much like the basic looks test, right? What's the first line of defense? The basic looks test. Yeah, that's why I say it's primarily that. But then it's like, okay, you get past the libido gap. You got most of these guys hooked on prawn. Okay, they still want girlfriends, despite the fact that even if they showed up to the event, they wouldn't be able to perform anyway. But it's like, okay, but why do they still want the companionship? Because of what you're talking about, the male mother need. So in short, yeah, I would agree with you. But I think um, men just have this ability to compartmentalize these things. And I think, like I said, I just said, for women, it's all kind of intertwined. But this is also why you're seeing, okay... These men have prawn addictions that they're getting for free. Their biological needs are met, yet they're still going to OnlyFans and paying this girl X number of dollars a month because they want the companionship. And that, and they figure like, oh, we could just put a price tag on it and buy it. But, um, you know, on my channel, I tend to advise against that because it's, it's kind of demeaning, in my opinion. But at the end of the day, you're a man and you can decide whatever you want to do. But um, the long and short is I don't, I don't really object to anything you've said. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, every, well, not every, any guys had experiences, carnal experiences, women have experienced what's referred to sometimes as post-com clarity, where you've, you've sort of blown your load, and any desire to spend time, further time with this female has, has been extinguished, you're sort of just, you'd rather just, you want to play the video game, you just want to not necessarily interact with her anymore, because effectively she serviced your needs and you know you're, you're good for a couple of hours if not an entire day or two right depending on how right. old you are in your libido so it's it, it is very often a, a separate thing where it is intertwined for women i think women sometimes deceive themselves in thinking it's not intertwined but i think just on average it is much uh, more so but i think you know as much as it, it it i find it a shame that a lot of these guys are wasting their money on things like uh, only fans and similar services uh Clearly, there's no solution to it because it wouldn't be so massive and mass massively invested in. But by the way, in case anyone hears background noise, I have to keep the window open. It's very hot here; otherwise, I will swelter and suffocate. So I apologize for that. But um, yeah, it's it's kind of here to stay, right? And the guys who are going to get sucked into it, that sort of thing, they're going to get sucked into that sort of thing. And it's is it predatory? Sure, but a lot of things are and. I guess the only thing you can do in that respect is just, you know, inform men and let them know what's actually going on there. Uh, yeah. But not much beyond that. True. And if uh, obviously, you know, some some men have have given up. Uh, per, we call them doomers, right? Yeah. And then there's some men who haven't given up. So it's like, okay, obviously, you know, if you if you haven't given up. The, the types of girls that are engaged in these types of activities that present themselves this way on social media, those are the ones you want to steer clear of. Yeah. Those are the ones that you want to avoid, for sure. So if you can avoid them, uh, you know, that's going to work to your benefit. But again, I, I think when you look at men in general, yeah, OnlyFans is just one avenue. I think all the things we do, um, be it video games or, you know, watching TV shows and things like this, again, there's a lot of escapism there. There is, and I think that's kind of like the poor substitute that we use for companionship, or at least to forget about the fact that we failed uh, in that regard. Um, yeah, at least to some degree. I mean, 
to varying degrees. I, mean, I, I think that, you know, the point of escapism, there are a lot of forms of escapism that would not be equally serviced even in a relationship. But sure, I mean, that, that at the end of the day, I've said this before, and we've kind of repeated the same point. I mean, life is cope, right? Everything is cope. Even even Chad Thunderschlong with a uh, harem of women and, you know, six-figure salary is, yeah, he's going to have to cope with certain things too. Uh, hard though that may be to believe. So, yeah, I think that, but I think there's nothing wrong with that. There's this idea, I think is very, there's so many different divisions of the manosphere these days, and if you want to call it that, I've, I've lost count, because there's this new generation, which is between, you know, kind of younger than yours, much younger than mine, sort of the wheat waffle style generation, you know, 21, 20, 19, uh, that age group, um, who are, I guess you say very black-pilled or alternatively red-pilled, but just really obsessed primarily with female conquest, and find it difficult to believe that somebody who's older might not have that same obsession. So yeah, in the case of, because I know this guy Hamza, I call him bathrobe man. You might know him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I figured that's who it was, but I wasn't yeah. 100% sure. Yeah, yeah, Thanks yeah. for confirming. He makes videos decrying video games all the time, how it's a waste of time. And of course, I mean, what, it, what isn't a waste of time in life is, yeah. But the point is, is that, it's a waste of time because what you should be doing is, you know, self-actualizing and doing X, Y, and Z, whatever. Um, because that's the demographic they're so obsessed with that. But I think if you may, I mean, someone who's much older, you know, close to 50, when you've made your peace with certain things, right, then a lot of that just isn't, isn't as appealing. Now, I'm not going to claim I had tremendous success throughout my life with, with women. I had a number of relationships. I had a number of uh, partners and coitus and what have you. It, it, you know, weren't overwhelming numbers, but enough. And people can't really get that. I, I, re I recently was watching this video by this guy called the CBB, CBP channel. It used to be called Coach Black Pill, and he changed it. I had him on once. And I was, he was doing a long stream and he mentioned my name towards the end and because and, and, he was talking about how he's gotten this itch to go travel and see the world because he's in his mid-30s or whatever. And, you know, he's like, uh, it's, 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 I, I, li I like Stardust enough, but, you know, there's kind of sitting behind a screen talking. Like, a lot of people don't know that I've spent most of my adult life outside the country of my birth. I've traveled the world. I've lived in eight different countries. I've been pretty much everywhere except Australia and Antarctica. Like, I've done all that stuff. It's not, when you get all these itches out of your system, uh, it's just not as appealing. I think that's the biggest divide I see in the manosphere. This, I, the people are just these, I guess you could call them go-getters or whatever, who can't imagine that somebody might be in a different stage of life or even possibly made their peace with I don't know, not being in a relationship. And so they'll immediately just say cope. Well, yeah, everything is cope. Uh, but... You know, I mean, you seem, I mean, uniquely, uh, or fair, not uniquely, pretty stoic, and but also reasonably content with your situation, uh, despite, you know, despite not being in a relationship. And I don't know how it is with, well, see, we use the terminology normies, neurotypical people, but a lot of these younger guys, they just can't, um, can't believe it. In fact, well, this guy, have you ever heard of Monday? He used to have a channel, and then he disappeared off youtube you know, for various yeah, reasons part of them. yeah his his whole channel he was um i guess he talked a lot about the incel phenomenon this was back in 2017 18 primarily a little bit of 2019 no no i think he was gone by then um but he was a pretty decent looking guy you know well put together earned well you know neat but for whatever reason relationships had passed him by and, then, and his whole channel is about sort of what had happened to him and how he could help other people. Eventually he found a girlfriend online of all places and then disappeared. So I guess mission fulfilled, but okay. yeah. uh, also not a pleasant, I mean, everyone knows who this person is. She's, <laughs> I don't know. It's, I, I'm a bit surprised at the person, but nonetheless, so I think a lot of people, and I used to have these conversations that I had still them up on my channel. I don't really get that experience, but I think it's because once you've experienced something, it, it becomes a little less significant. And I remember before I, I, I had CODIS, 
you know, decades ago, I just thought I could, all I could think about, not even just because of libido, just because, you know, I need to get it done because otherwise, you know, life doesn't make sense. It's like a rite of passage for men. Yeah. Yeah. And then I had my, my first, I guess, relationship, if you want to call it that, didn't last too long. And you know, we got it done and I just thought, oh, uh, was that it? You know, okay. That was pretty much my reaction as well. Yeah. And and I think a lot, a lot of life is is like that. But these, these sort of milestones and having certain experiences, and I think um, one of the reasons why there's so much of a divide in the manosphere these days is because the generational gaps have just grown enormous for all sorts of reasons. You know, we'll talk about some of them. But the, yeah. the the existence of a you know near fifty something versus a twenty something, a twenty one year old, it's so different. The, the dating market is different. Everything is different. And yeah. when I was, when I got started on YouTube over 10 years ago, <clears throat> you know, Barbarossa's time, a lot of these guys who would talk about the stuff, they were married or you know, they were divorced, better put, gone through all these experiences. It's just not, so it's kind of a new dynamic. Um, and I think that uh, this is one of the reasons why Older guys are just so unrelatable uh, to the younger guys, but also the I think the younger guys are not. My, my sense, and maybe you can correct me around. I think the the newest generation has a kind of know it all attitude that, I mean, it's always been there, but it seems more pronounced these days. Which is to say, they think that the guys have gone before them have nothing of relevance to say. Uh, I've noticed that. Uh, maybe I'm imagining. I don't know if you've picked up on that at all uh, yourself. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you, right? Because like for me, the twenties weren't that long ago, right? Yeah. Uh, the the twenties were like what, like ten years ago? Yeah. When I was like twenty three, I I was the same way. Like I thought, like yeah, I got the world figured out. Yeah, the Illuminati, all this stuff. Yeah, I got it all figured out. I know exactly what they're doing. This, that, and the third. And let's be honest, yeah, all that stuff's going on. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to affect your life. You know, at the um, you know, the molecular level, let's say. But eventually you, you know, keep living life. You go through the rest of your 20s. You start having more experiences. And then you're like, maybe I don't know everything. And more importantly, maybe it's okay that I don't know everything. Because it, you know, it also raises the question, like, who puts the pressure on you to know everything? It's like, nobody did that. You don't have to know everything. But yeah, sometimes like when I watch channels like Wheat Waffles, and again, it's great content, all right? But sometimes it's like, okay, it's it's so methodical that that you think it's like a one size fits all type deal. I have lately been making a distinction, and you know some some of the um, people in the space might roll their eyes at this, but again, I generally always say that you know especially when talking about women, there's two flavors. There's there's the traditional, and there's the um, there's the you know westernized modern woman. They're two very different creatures, and it is a function of generational stuff, you know. You know, we could say ground zero was the baby boomers, and then from there, it kind of all just stemmed out. But take, for example, my job. I work with a bunch of, you know, like Eastern European women, and they're very different. They're very different from, like, what we have here. And they're all married and so on and so forth, happily so. And, you know, gender roles are embraced and all that. So, again, when I look at these generations, um, I do see what you're saying, that there are these know-it-alls. And I would say, you know, Hamza, you know, he's very prescriptive. For example, with what he says, he's like, "This is the way you do it." But... He's trying to sell a product. I get it. You know, you're, when you're selling a product, you need, and I think in some sense, wheat waffles is too. I mean, there. I remember when I was talking to wheat waffles, and I, I'm not, I'm not faulting him for anything. I mean, the first thing before we had a conversation was he wanted to check how many views I got. It was all very methodical, very, you know, because you know he's trying to build his channel, whatever. I get that. So yeah, you need a prescriptive formula if you're selling a product. Say, look, you need to do this, you need to do this, go to the gym, uh, wear this. Do... Yeah. That makes sense, right? Yeah, it's very different from like, say, my approach though, where I'm just like, like the white pill playlist is like the whole playlist of prescriptions, right? It's the idea like, look, I'm gonna tell you what all these people think around the world about this stuff, and then I'm gonna let you decide. You you get you get yourself a prescription because I I don't know you better than you know you. It's just it's just there's no way. Exactly. Right. Well, that, that's the problem. I mean, this is such a huge point, but very briefly because I I always think this is on the on the point of Eastern European women. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's the case in the office environment you're working. I doubt you'd be making that up, but 
this has been a long-term thing. A lot of people say, oh, go to Eastern Europe, find a traditional woman. The divorce rates in Eastern Euro Europe are higher than they are in the United States, just for the record. So yeah. tradition, yes, maybe, but it's not nearly as stable as people, people like to believe. Of course, uh, because, yeah, in Eastern Europe, like that traditionalism, that's just standard fare, right? But if you bring that traditionalism over here in the West, men are looking at that like, this is refreshing. This is nice. So again, it's two different perspectives as well. So again, um, men might be more inclined to play ball with that uh, type of thing. Maybe. I think there's an acute risk of bringing women out of their original environment to a Western uh, well, style. Also, well, I agree yeah. with you, but, I'm, but we're also assuming that very much like my colleagues, they're already here. There's right. nothing you can do about yeah, it, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. But I'm saying like, hey, if you're in the West, it's like, okay. I'm not getting on an airplane and geomaxing. I'm not doing that. Okay, so that means you're probably going to have a girlfriend, not wife, because, again, why would you sign the contract in the West? You're crazy if you do. If you're going to get a long-term girlfriend in the West, it's like, okay, what's going to maximize my chances of success where I don't really have to worry about this thing going down the toilet, right? Well, traditional values is definitely going to be priority one because it's like the modern is just incompatible, right? I'm masculine. So a, a woman who's masculine trying to out masculine me like that, that's not going to cut it. Right. But, um, yeah, I mean, ultimately men have to decide as you like to say, sometimes is the juice worth the squeeze? Like you have to decide that. But, yeah. um, yeah, it's, but then you, again, you have people like wheat waffles and Hamza who try to be very prescriptive with it because of the reasons you outlined. And again, it's good information. And we always say like, you know, there are exceptions to the rule. You have to decide, though, if digging through the dirt to get to the diamonds is worth it. The diamonds exist. Yeah. There's no, like, people bring it up all the time. There's no shortage of people saying, wait, wait, I know a diamond, you know? But it's like, all right, yeah, but know, look at all this dirt. Nawals, <laughs> Nawals, yes, not all women are like that. And yeah, almost, at, well, axiomatically, that's the case. There are going to be exceptions to everything. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you're going to. You're gonna find men who are five foot two, and you're gonna find women who are six foot five. Is it is it rare? Yeah, it really is, depending on where you live. But uh, yeah. but I mean, to th the point you brought up, and I think this is something that I, I really near and dear to my heart is that with all the guruism going on these days, and there's a lot of guruism, and I'm you know I'm not in particular an individual like like bathrobe man, right? Uh, look, I get. In theory, it's possible to want to help people, but the, the problem is circumstances are often so individual as are individuals themselves. Correct. Finding these one shoe size fits all solutions just typically doesn't work, and so it's an to my mind, it's an enormous amount of responsibility. Uh, one of the the uh, the quips I've gotten over the many years, you know, so you don't offer solutions. Well, I talk about different things, but no, I don't say, okay, here's what you need to do. You need to go out and do it. Because I know that's what people want, especially younger guys. They want to hear something along those lines. But not only would I be lying to myself and saying that, well, I figured it out. Here's what you need to do. I, I don't have a, oftentimes a clue about what to say about somebody else's life. You know, I don't know the individual, their circumstances, uh, their struggles. Their, it's just so I think de facto that position of, of doling out advice is necessarily dishonest because Unless you for preface some, it the way you do. People. Yeah, for, for some, some people. people. Yeah. yeah, because for some others, it's going to resonate quite clearly. Well, yeah. Take people and leave the rest, you know. But, I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, again, this is why I think, you know, just sort of not putting it behind a paywall, not looking about the money, don't care about that. And, you know, I, I make a perspective on character. Like, almost every week I make a video about that. Those videos don't really get a lot of views. But it's important to talk about those kind of things because it's like, again, it answers the question, now what? And, you know, usually when I make these videos, there are people that say like, yeah, you know, I kind of live my life by Taoism or, yeah, I kind of live my life by this. And that works for me. And then there's other people that don't like I could post a video like I posted a video way back on uh, anti-natalism. Right. The idea that, like, you yeah. know, life is suffering. So why would you bring a kid into this world? And, blah, blah, blah. and again, very divisive. There are some people that believe this is the way you should live and others that don't. So how are you going to give a one size fits all when even on something like this, you got people with two different views on things? Yeah, I mean that. Well, that's a interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm very, I'm not an anti natalist myself. I'm very sympathetic to it. I, I'm not, the only reason I'm not is because it's just, it's not a position you can convince people of because organisms exist to reproduce. It's, uh, it's very different. I mean, 
it's it's potentially possible. I'm not saying I want to do this. This isn't my business. But let's say you really wanted to convince people that you know firearm ownership were a bad thing. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying let's say this. You could potentially convince someone of, of that case, even if they're you know dying in the wool about it. Right. I don't think you can do the same thing about. Hmm, do you know that you'll potentially be inflicting suffering on your? Yeah, I mean. So, but I'm sympathetic to it, and I've looked into it over the years very extensively. I've read a lot of literature and. Yeah, I think it's compelling, uh, at least the anti-natalist position. I think the, the natalist position is a lot less compelling on average, but you know, it's a separate discussion. But yeah, you know, putting the information out there is uh, the way you do it, I think, is why your channel is so, so good, is, I think, the way to go. And yeah. not that one shoe size fits all. You know, let the way, again, the different types of videos put out there, let the things kind of stew in people's heads and and then think about it for a while to see, well, you know, may, this seems to make sense. That may or may not make sense. Um, because right. I think it's a, be, it's a better approach than, yeah. And some people, the stuff, like the the bathrobe guy stuff just resonates. Like, oh, go stop playing those video games. Hit the gym, bro. Yeah, some of them really get something out of it. But yeah, uh, I'm right. noticing even now <laughs> with his, his raves about uh, video games and some people, well, it's okay to play video games in moderation. <laughs> no, you can't. And the guy's literally saying, even if you spend an hour a day, you could spend that hour doing something productive like reading how to build, be a carpenter to build chairs and tables. I'm like, okay. Or, or, or chasing women who don't want you. Yeah, yeah. it's just, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, I can't really uh, relate to that. Uh, I think productivity is, is good. I mean, there's a yeah, point it, where you want, it, yeah. Go on, go on. Yeah, but you you have to want to do it. You have to want to do it. Yeah, I um I I kind of have this saying in life because like I'll I'll tell you I got my driver's license when I was twenty five, and then probably for like two three years I just could not work up the courage to get on the highway. Like I just couldn't. Like I was paralyzed with fear that like if I got on the highway it was an irrational fear something would happen to me. And then one day I just went and I did it right. And what I'm trying to drive at here is that everyone has their highway, right? Yeah. So. You know, you're ready when you're ready and you're going to do what you want to do. These these solutions, if you want to call them that, they're custom tailored. Everybody and their grandma is a motivational speaker trying to sell you something. But the truth of the matter is the only person that's going to be able to devise the solution for you is you. And usually it hits you while you're just chilling in the living room watching TV or something. And you're like, huh, oh, yeah, OK, I'm going to enact that starting tomorrow. And then life gets better. But, you know, again, you have these Zoomers, again, they're, they grew up in the internet age, right? Where information is readily available everywhere. There's no, like, winging it and guesswork. But there's things like this that are very subjective, and it's like, no, there is no there is no step-by-step -step on how, how to fix this. There's just basic rules and information, general things, red flags, green flags, things you look for, things you don't. But at the end of the day, the only way you're going to get the... the um, the experience you need to custom tailor your solution is to, is to go out there and get some data points. I mean, that that's really what's going to boil down to. Yeah. I actually uh, never got my driver's license. And um, two reasons. One reason, I literally had no interest. Uh, so I just, you know, I'm an interest in something. You're not probably not going to do it. That's the biggest reason. Second reason, yeah. I, I, I just don't, I don't, I wouldn't trust myself with my sleep issues. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I could potentially put myself in a dangerous situation. But I mean, really, Never had any interest. That was always, you know, man, that, that got me points docked frequently in, in interactions with females, uh, uh, believe me. Because, you know. Yeah, they, they really care about that. Chris, Chris Rock, he, he did a funny skit about that way back in the day. He was like, yeah, remember the first time you dated a guy who had his own car? You're never taking the bus again. Or a guy who had his own apartment? You're never dating a guy who lives in his mama's house again. Yeah. You know, just think. Just things like this. Again, he says that basically women can't go backwards in lifestyle. It's Absolutely. true. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, and I think, I mean, part part of it is, you know, it's a it's an interesting discussion we can talk about that too. And I grew up in New York City, and well, yeah. anyone's Do you know, I having a car is almost a hindrance. Well, it, it is, and I mean, uh, my father, who's well into his eighties now, every time I talk to him on the phone, if I bother to ask. You know, there's been some tires lifted from the car, right? I mean, the, it, it, not only is the, the crime issue, uh, but it's also just who wants to drive in the congestion of New York City. So, whereas in contrast that in particular with a place like the United States, the vast majority of the United States has very poor infrastructure. 
in terms of transportation. Yeah. So the idea of not having a car is you might as well have five heads. You know, well, you don't have, you don't have, you don't drive. Um, it's, it's, um, you know, having spent most of my adult life in Europe, yeah, I'd, I'd say that th that's less of a shock just because transport infrastructure, but so it's, that's definitely less of an issue, even for uh, talking to women in my experience than it is in the States, but it, it can be uh, one of those things. For sure. um, but yeah, I, I think, and that's an excellent point you made as well, the point I try to make in my my uh, video about the crisis of motivation, recent video, is that uh, well, you know, motivation finds you. It, it, it's yes. It, you don't. You don't. There isn't a plan. You don't. You know, get a notepad out and write everything. Okay, now I'm gonna. I've taken steps one, two, and three of four. Is gonna when I'm gonna find my motivation. I think a lot of the cases of the sort of the guru types, the guys that claim it resonates with them, and maybe it does. They're, they're, they're lacking that intrinsic motivation, and so they're trying to externalize it. And understandably, if you're desperate to find some baseline motivation, you will latch on to virtually anything, so including potentially you know, some guy on the internet saying, this is what you need to do, guys, and hit the gym. And blah, blah. But unfortunately, and this is the bad news, it's a mysterious thing. Uh, as I've gotten older, I've gotten less and less motivated. Not something I really like or enjoy. Uh, I, you know, and and some of the revelations I had uh, that it's just you, you you cannot you know snap your fingers and just whip it up out of uh, thin air. Extrinsic motivation, as I said in that video, is, is easier because no one really wants to go homeless. They want to pay the bills. But the thing that I've noticed is it's just when you really want to do something internally, it's just so much better. Than you know the whip hand on your back, so to speak, and uh, yeah. it's there's no magic solution to that. There really isn't. And part of the problem, especially for young guys these days, is even if they're intrinsically, somewhat intrinsically motivated, there needs to be some kind of carrot in the, at the end on the stick. And it's hard to, it's at least guys, I guess, do it well. Guys like Hamza, but it's hard to sell, to my mind, an honest vision of. Yes, if you put in the work, you will be rewarded. It's more like you can work your buttocks off, and maybe if you're lucky, something good will come of it. Whereas in, in former times, at least the illusion, if you, and maybe it was authentic, it's hard to say, the illusion of putting in the time and work for certain extrinsic rewards that nonetheless were important related to job or status or, or women right. were more realizable than they are now. I think it's a kind of a toy cost at best. These are, yeah, you can put in the work, but maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't. And if you put in all that work and have nothing to show for it, that's not going to feel very uh, satisfying or rewarding either. You know? No, it doesn't. And I speak as someone who had a bachelor's in uh, business management finance and a master's in global business and finance, and I struggled for like three years to find a job. It uh, Thankfully, I had no debt, but... It just made me reach this conclusion like, well, why did I just spend six years in college doing all that? Why did I do that? But then when I went back and got the accounting degree, a much more practical job, less vague, and got the CPA, then it was like, okay, now I'm seeing the payoff. Now I'm seeing it. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, like you said, extrinsic, yeah, you can watch a Hamza video and he could try to beat motivation into your skull, but that's not going to work for everybody. Um, you know, like, for example, when I quit drinking, that was intrinsic motivation. And I'm st yeah. I'm sober coming up on almost four years now. I was going to ask you about that, yeah. Yeah. So, again, it's like, okay, here's this guy going for 10 years straight on a bender, and it's like one day he just decides, I'm not going to do it anymore. What is that? That's intrinsic motivation. That's intrinsic. That came from me. Nobody else told me. Other people have tried to tell me, and I didn't listen to them. But then one day I was just like, all right, no, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to die if I, if I keep doing this. And, I, and then I stopped. Yeah, good point to start asking you. I was going to ask you more. I mean, so how would you say did your alcoholism uh, start? Because I think that a lot of people struggle with substance abuse uh, yeah. of different sorts. I, I think 
you know, one thing I've talked about off and on my channel frequently is I think it is a sub is food. You know, the obesity epidemic is a substance abuse epidemic, but it's it's uh, the problem with that, and I think it's in some ways so much trickier than alcohol. Is it you don't need alcohol to survive; you need to eat occasionally. Um, right. Obviously, you being the great uh, slim giant you are, you don't suffer from uh, a food addiction or anything. But how how did you get into the, the drinking habit to the point where you you well you characterize yourself as an alcoholic? Yeah. So. Um... Those who watch my channel know I came from a strong two-parent household. So I saw what like an ideal, if you want to call it that, relationship should look like. And that really messes things up when you go into the real world and get hit with reality and how it really works. Um, that being said, for me, really the the watershed moment was when my dad died. That That's really what did it. Because my father, probably out of me and my two brothers, I probably had the closest relationship with my dad. He was basically my best friend. So it's like I wasn't just losing my dad. I was losing my best friend. And for a 19-year-old you know, guy, that it's really hard to deal with that because you were thinking in the back of your head like, ah, oh, he's 52. He, he should have had at least like another 30 years on the planet. But what happened was, you know, he was 10 blocks away on 9-11. He inhaled whatever the hell that smoke stuff was. You know, he tried to walk it off like a man. And, you know, he didn't go to the pulmonologist when they offered. And it bit him in the ass. But yeah, coming to terms with that was really, really difficult. Not to mention, I already had problems, you know, with the opposite sex and rejection and things like that, which is normal stuff that a teenager goes through um, and young adults go through. But then on top of that, you're going to hit me with this uh, curveball. And it was just like, all right, I don't even have my dad to talk to about this stuff now. It's like, oh, man. So that was really like the, um, the trigger for sure. And it took me a long, long time to come to terms with the fact that he was gone. It really, really did years and drinking is how i dealt with that couple this with the fact that i went to college i felt like i did everything that was expected of me everything i was supposed to do perfectly perfect not perfect gpas but very high gpas i did everything i was supposed to do and the workplace was just like yeah so what like <laughs> and it was like wow this is the world <laughs> sounds I, I i i i definitely won't let you talk but it's, it's so it's so much related to what you're saying I grew up in a time, like I said, I'm about you know, a little, probably 16, 17 years older. Thing is, when I was growing up, there was still this mantra that I would hear from my parents about, you know, having a college degree, as they put it, was the, the ticket to getting employment. Very sort of, well, they weren't even very specific, just having a degree, you know, anything, right? Yep. Because in their time, you know, my mother's almost 80 and my father's well in his 80s, that was the case. It was a... I wouldn't say unique, but it was reasonably remarkable, and it was a big deal. So I, I grew up with that. I, I went to university, undergraduate, in the mid '90s, and 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 it, so I heard that constantly, and I just thought, well, I got out, and yeah, I mean, I studied useless junk. I mean, truly useless junk. Uh, I mean, far less useless than your stuff. I was, it's, you know, classics and things of that nature. But I, I nonetheless, I had I had bitten, I had sort of uh, bitten the bait. Uh, to, well. Yeah, I guess, and it was very, very different. So I had not very little to show for. It. I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's just very relatable because that rhetoric was still ongoing. And but uh, yeah, yeah, and sadly, it is still ongoing. This idea of like, yeah, take on all this student loan debt. So I, don't, I didn't have debt. Like, I went to a public. Uh, I went in the SUNY system. So yeah. thank the gods, uh, it was cheap. I also did a little part time work, so that wasn't an issue. It was just. The promise of, oh, you you have an education now, and I have pretty good grades. Uh, now yeah. you have uh, now you have nothing, right? And so I realized yeah. I'd have to do something different, and so I I, I, I ended up getting training as, uh, as an ESL teacher for a long time. I did that. Had nothing really to do with what I wanted to do uh, at the time, but yeah. And anyway, I didn't want to interrupt you, but yeah. So you had these multiple factors you know the fact that what you'd studied wasn't really paying off and the loss of your father yeah so i mean again think about it right i was working in the pharmacy at the time i was being professionally rejected my best friend was dead and i, I always mention this all the time when i was still like you know running simp game and stuff like this there was this i did the stupid thing and dipped the pen tried to dip the pen in company ink which you don't do um there was that girl that i worked with pharmacy for five years. Yeah, and I worked with this girl for five years, and I got hung up on her like an idiot. 
So I'm being romantically rejected as well. And it just all just kept compounding and compounding and compounding. But then finally things turned around when I got in 2017, I got to leave the pharmacy behind and start a new chapter of my life. And again, I think a, a sort of Matthew effect came into play. All right, things are starting to go good now. So maybe if I keep pushing, I can get another good thing and then another good thing and then another good thing instead of this vicious spiral. And I think that's ultimately what triggered that intrinsic motivation to make me go. All right. If, I, if life's going to keep going good, that like I got to stop the drinking. It's like, why am I going to prematurely die when things are going good? Like, excellent you know, point. Again, I have to interject because it's an excellent point. But to the Matthew effect, for those who don't know, best summarize and to those who have all shall be given to those who have not all shall be taken. Uh, yeah, basically success builds upon success. That's the Matthew principle, uh, which explains, I think, a lot of what we can observe today of why so many guys uh, feel hopeless and just out to, uh, yeah, out to yeah. lunch on this. Because the, the, when you have no, when you have almost no success in anything, there's hard, people don't realize that. I think a lot, of, I mean, again, I don't mean to interrupt, but it's sort of dynamic conversation. The, the problem with just telling people, you know, why aren't you motivated? This is if someone has not had a single iota of success, try, you know, walking a mile in their shoes. It's it's hard because everything you've tried has failed. You, know, you tried the little league when you're it, it sucked. I mean, I remember I, I'm a very unathletic person. Unfortunately, you know, the many cursed genes I bear that was unathleticism was one of them, and so I tried little league out as a, as a kid and. I quite literally got put in left field, I mean, literally, where nothing, you know, that's, for those who don't know, uh, I guess it's a bit of an American, to, to be put in left field, it'd be literally, quite literally, it's the place where the least action takes place. Because so. they didn't, you know, they obviously I was stuck on the team, but they, they either on the bench or you know, they put you out there. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it took a long time to find any modicum of success. And the one thing I noticed is when I when I did find success in something, I voraciously pursued it, and I don't think I could at the time really disentangle my actual interest in the subject matter from the fact that I was just really good at it. Uh, it, it a lot of overlap potentially. I, I didn't really care. I just know I was I was kicking buttocks and doing really well, and 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 I think that's something people just miss out on uh, because again, success begets success, and failure begets failure. And I think that it's a, you're spot on when you say you had that sort of aha moment, the Matthew effect kicks in and you're kind of put on a new track. Yeah. 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 And I think in that when you, when you mentioned that, yeah, a lot of these guys, unfortunately, there's just so much failure. It, it basically beats you into submission. Doesn't Absolutely. It? Absolutely. And, and, and one of the things we talk about on my channel is we try to get these guys out of that nihilistic valley, but the only thing you really have to offer is extrinsic motivation but i try to kind of get the brain juices going and kind of get you on the path to intrinsic motivation but it's a difficult fight and i don't think women in particular would understand because again like you mentioned earlier like with the companionship gap i guess let's call it the libido gap and the companion gap or unless you can come up with a better term for it yeah, that's fine yeah where basically they have a support system. They get attention and validation. If they're having a bad day, they can go on social media, post a picture, and like they got their validation and support system, or at least what is acceptable to them as that. So yeah. again, they can kind of just kind of create this positive Matthew effect loop on demand. Men do not have this luxury, and I think that's why you're kind of seeing this creation of like a manosphere type thing taking shape in the past decade plus, while there really is no female counterpart to that, no. because there doesn't really need to be, because life doesn't really suck that much for them. No, I mean, <laughs> perfect case in point. Here's yeah. an example. You know, Matt, I've seen this time and again. You know, some woman, you know, Instagram posts or, or tweet tweets, oh, my day stood me up. Oh, it's okay, honey, you'll be okay. And then gets a million. I mean, she gets some attention to sort of make up for it. <laughs> Imagine yeah. a guy doing that. You laughed at. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It, you men. Well, not only that, I mean, there's the fact that part of the, I know that there's in lookism, a lot of the sort of performative aspects of male existence vis-a-vis -vis women are, are sort of discounted. But I, I think there is a performative aspect in the sense that achieving something is important. So, you know, if you're a, a 38 year old bum, you might still be pretty good looking. Maybe some woman will want to bang you, maybe, but 
long-term partnership? Probably not. I mean, let's be honest. To be a successful woman in terms of relationships, you know, be attractive, obviously, most important thing. Have yep. Be reasonably pleasant. Be pleasant. Boom, you've won. You've won. I mean, I think of... Here's a kind of random, but very... Uh, do you know who uh, Hathor uh, Bjornsson is? He uh, was one of the... I think he has the world record deadlift. This guy from Iceland, right? Gigantic guy, practically seven feet tall. I think he is seven feet tall. I'm not sure. Right. Um, his his wife is some petite waitress he met, I think, in Canada or something, five foot two. Pretty, tr- pretty whatever. I mean, he had to be, you know, one of the world's strongest men, world renowned. This, it just doesn't work that way for men, right? You, you can't. It's so. Yeah, having that sense of achievement, not just for obvious, you know, women recognize, but it, it's important because if you don't have that, it's sort of, you know, what are you? And Correct. And I think the surefire way to make sure intrinsic motivation never comes is to make women the object, like the end game. That's the sure yeah. way. Because I, I, one of the things I always say is like, if you're going to do all this stuff, do it for yourself. You know, you need to be the end game because if you're not the end game, you, you, you're never going to see any payoff. You know, because one, the minute you make women the object of all this stuff that you're being intrinsically motivated to do, there is this expectation versus reality dichotomy. And you're expecting one thing, but you're getting another. It's kind of like the nice guy who says, oh, just because I pay for the date, you know, you should invite me up to your apartment. And it's like, well, where did that expectation come from? Where did that yeah. come from? And it just expectations lead to disappointment for sure. But the reason why that that guy, again, got the waitress Again, sure, maybe she was attracted to him because he's renowned and all that stuff. But again, very much like you just put, at the end of the day, men are simple. We don't care about your money. We don't care about your status. Like that doesn't matter to us. It's like it's like, are you pleasant to be around and do you take care of yourself? Like 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 you said, that's pretty much it. It's not complicated. Though through the manosphere, men are starting to wisen up. They're starting to see and I wanted to like build on this. Because they're starting to see long-term impacts of like women just you know being on social media posting body pics and all this stuff, women who are engaging in you know just casual fun all the time and how that could affect their marriages in the future. So men are wisening up, and they're 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 seeing other factors besides just being pleasant and being good looking. You know, because there's a lot you can hide behind the veneer of uh, pleasantries. Well, I think so. in the current dating meta or mating meta, there's certain archetypes that have emerged. Some of them, there's a certain archetype of a female I've observed, and you know, I'm well past my prime. But if I if I identified her, you know, she, yes, she spends copious amounts of time online, engaging in you know, Instagram posts or or what have you. This sort of thing, yeah, that, that's just kind of auto. Whatever your actual chances would be, just that's just not not going to be of interest um, because you just know, maybe not 100 percent, it's very likely. That this is not going to be a reliable person in, in any sort of romantic setting, maybe not even in a human setting. Correct. So people who are glued to social media, I think it's true of males too. I mean, if you were if you were a female looking for a guy, I, I'm not sure if uh, trying to find some I don't know, social media gadfly would be a good idea either. And so the, these archetypes have emerged, and they're you know people to basically avoid, no matter how pl- quote unquote pleasant they might be or good looking they are. And, um, yeah, there, there definitely was, and I've always driven home the point as well. I mean, this is just my own kind of cumulative experience over the years in various relationships that the, some amount of interest overlap, I think is, is often important too, because Especially when it comes to sort of video game tolerance and, and what have you, that's that's a tolerance is an important word. There's a lot of women. Uh, I remember years ago when I was living in New York City, I'd actually cohabitate again with my parents due to the the uh, the Great Recession, and I was I was working various jobs at a, a girlfriend at the time in, in Brooklyn, and I kept on making suggestions. You know, to, let's go to the botanical gardens, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Yes. Let's do this. Let's do that. No, nah, she was young, eleven years younger than I was. Pretty cute Korean, and I just gave up. I said, you know what? I'm gonna go play. I'm gonna play some. I'm gonna play some Mass Effect. <laughs> she didn't even know what that was, uh, and she got all upset about it. And so, so that's important. 
But I found that, I mean, if you're actually passionate about something, then the, your partner having no clue about that, it can often be difficult. I mean, for example, I know a guy... I mean, this guy, I think, is I've been studying him for about two years because he's such a, I think, in, you know, remarkable individual. He's only about 23, and he's already been, he's already married, and it, I think he's on the track to success. Like, they're going to knock kids out and the whole shebang. And they also have a common interest that kind of binds them. It's sort of the relationship everyone would probably would like to have, but, you know, percentage-wise, chances they're just never going to have it. And I've seen right. that operate, too. So the idea here being that, yeah, at, at baseline, what men care about is attractive, are you pleasant to be around, but then, and that's great, um, but, you know, there, there's some other things that can work in that, too. I mean, I, in some sense, I think it'd be, it almost behoove men to adapt, not a female perspective, but sort of the laundry list that women have is, is endless, potentially, and ridiculous at times, but maybe the list that men have is almost too short. Uh, you can say, well, that'll limit your your chances. Well, sure, but how good are your chances these days anyway? If you're if you're Mr. Average, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And I, 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 you know what it is? I think a lot of men, you know, because of libido gap and companion gap, whatever you want to call it, um, the idea it's like you can have standards, and they're like, I can, and it's like, yes, <laughs> you can have expectations of of the opposite gender. Yeah. Yeah, but a lot, a lot of these dudes, they're just like, I thought I was just supposed to do everything. And it's like, no, that, that's what the blue pill matrix told you. It's like, no, like you're, you're allowed to have standards on things. You're allowed to have things that are just unacceptable. And sure, you know, you tell a girl that and maybe, maybe she'll raise an eyebrow, she'll roll her eyes because she's not used to being spoken to like that. But at the end of the day, you know, if you just kind of keep that same energy wherever you go, sooner or later, I mean, there is going to be some respect that you command. For that consistency, I would say for sure. But I definitely think um, in the standards department, men collectively definitely need to beef that up. This whole simp epidemic thing, like that's like I think ground zero. We gotta like do something about that. But yeah, the, you, vagina you, with you head talk to me. Oh, it's so great! You're so amazing. Yeah. But again, even not simping requires intrinsic motivation, and that brings us back to square one again. So you know that that. It's one of those things. It's like, it's like, you know what it's like? It's like when you're outside raking leaves, but then like the wind just blows more leaves on your front and mm. then you have to sweep more leaves. It's just like endless leaves <laughs> coming in. That's kind of what it's like when you're trying to deal with this whole, you know, simp thing. It makes it difficult for the rest of us because it establishes unrealistic expectations on the part of women as well. So. Simping to these days, I find, I mean, I, I, I could get, you know, when I was 17, you know, eons ago, uh, you know, in the, I guess the early 90s or whatever. I was a little bit of a simp sometimes. I remember there was this girl in my high school, and the only thing I remember was her name. Her name was Kaya, and she had these huge jugosauri. And I simped a little bit for her at the time. Because, right. yeah, it was like big, big juggers, you know? Why not? You're but 17, I, though. It's acceptable. It's, it, and and it's, this is pre internet as well. Now, yeah. I think. In today's day and age, with all the information available, and unless you're living under a rock, which some people do, I mean, the internet, I haven't checked it out yet. I've been falling behind your videos, so my apologies, but uh, your most recent video on communication, and I think you bring up the internet, I assume you bring up the internet. Um, yep. I mean, there are different rocks people hide. I mean, there, there are normie types, these are sort of my definition, who are just, they, they have no intersection crossover with the stuff we think about, talk about. They're just, going about their business and 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 so yeah it is possible to live under a rock uh but i think if you're even a little bit keyed in the, the kind of really crass and, and extreme uh simpism you see that allows only fans to exist and women to reap the rewards from that or you know twitch streamers and you know female twitch I mean, that's the sort of thing that i do find baffling because a little bit baffling because i I'd assume that a lot of these guys would have access to this information uh, to some level. And also, I can't imagine really get. I, I can think back in the day, say with Kaya, when she was quote unquote nice to me. Yeah, there's that nice little kind of tingly feel. Oh, you know, she's paying attention or whatever. Yeah. But I don't know, the online situation is it's a little bit too transparent, I think. It's a little bit too obvious that it's one thing to simp in real life, I guess, but. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's very destructive. I I just don't know a good solution because you'd think 
I mean, the information is out there. Everyone, everyone and his cousin knows about simping and how it's not very helpful to anyone, at least of which, you know, at least of them, you know, the men engaging in it. But nonetheless, yeah. it's it's ubiquitous, right? Yeah, I, I guess. Um, here's the thing. I, I think when you simp, it's like when you really that like simping essentially is really just like emotional investment, right? You're investing your time and your energy and yeah. there's no reciprocity. Again, at the end of the, the road for simping, there is only pain. So yeah. it's like, again, it's like I can tell you, like, yo, stop touching the stove. But that's extrinsic, right? Again, at the end of the day, he has to burn his hand enough to the point where he doesn't feel it anymore. And then he's like, oh, man, maybe I shouldn't have done that. You know, there's just there's nothing you can do really to, to make someone stop. But if you're the kind of person where it's like you've already reached that point where you've said, hey, I'm not going to do that anymore. All you can really do is make your case. And, you know, the longer I'm, I'm online making videos and the, the bigger the base grows, the more opposition I inevitably find. And it's like, look, man, if, you, if you're not ready for the information, you're not ready. You, you come here. You know, they always say that the Manosphere doesn't go out and recruit. They come to us. So, yeah, you know, that that's kind of how I approach it. It's like, listen, if you're not ready to talk about it, okay. But eventually you're going to have enough failures and that negative Matthew effect is going to beat you into submission and you're going to want answers. It's going to happen eventually. I just don't know when. Yeah, I don't think that's one of the reasons why I like your channel. You're not offering so the answer and i think people come at this at uh, different stages especially these days uh back in when i got started because i in a lot of ways i'm the last relic of that time everyone who was around back then is gone i'm still around i guess mostly men i you know married i've never been married but you know had some experiences and then for me it was just sort of this great relief of oh wow i'm not the only one uh, who thinks this or imagining this. I remember, you know, well before the internet really got off the ground thinking you know, women are acting in a really strange way or why is that acceptable? And you know, I had to keep it to myself because there wasn't some platform I could go talk on and there was nobody I could talk to about. And, uh, you know, the best you could get is, oh, you, from guys, no, oh, women, you know, they're just, that's just the way they are. And um, yeah. now it just seems, wow, information overload on the one hand, but uh, I think that, yeah, I think on balance it's good, though, even if it's a bit mercantile, so the likes of Wheat Waffles and Hums, or that the guys at least have some information on sort of basic tactics versus Correct. the sort of, when I was, I didn't have a clue. Nobody told me anything. I mean, I, 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 I mean, and I, growing up in the 80s and the 90s, it, it, this, this information just wasn't there. I didn't have any success in, with women in high school. I didn't have any success with women until I got, I, I started going to university or college, as it's called in the news. And um, that was the first time I had any uh, real success. Um, and I was just stumbling my way through it. You know, I, I just, it, it took a long time to realize, oh, there's a system to this, I guess. And yeah, this is a different era for that reason as well. And I think it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think it's coincidence that very much my, like myself, um, high school, college, that's kind of where you have your best opportunities. We call that the teen love pill, the idea that essentially, you know, that's when you're going to have more consistent social circles. So the maximum opportunity to, uh, to get something going is in those types of situations where you have consistent social circles, which is why I tell people to go to places that showcase their interests. Otherwise, what happens? The reality is after you get out of college, it's like, okay, unless you're actively going to the same places and meeting the same people again and again, you probably don't have a stable social circle to establish comfort with women. So the probability of getting a relationship becomes more remote. And I think that's what caused online dating to really kind of take a substitute for that because people kept putting off relationships instead of like talking to the people they go to high school and college with. They just kind of kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And now you have a lot of single people who just, they just, they, well, they don't know what to do. It's not just that. I mean, I can attest to this. As well. I mean, yeah. all of my contacts these days have been reduced. I mean, some of them are quite, I've met them in real life, but initially met them online. Yeah. Because I've, I mean, this is something, you know, I guess because of the dark side of, see, I never did it to Geomax. That's the weird people don't believe me. I travel a lot and whatever. But and when you move around a lot, you, you lose out on opportunities oftentimes to sort of build consistent relationships. Yes. The few few ones I did have, you know, they've evaporated. Uh, one, 
you know, got hitched, uh, knocked a kid out, and the wife never liked me anyway, so all the more reason to, you know, he disappeared, and so, yeah, you can definitely end up in a position, it's so much harder when you're older, when you're not just constantly being forced into social situations due to, for example, exactly. your classes that you have to attend, or whatever it might be, to uh, form social bonds with people, um, and I think on some level the internet is great because it does allow you uh, kind of flexibility that otherwise wouldn't be there. On the other hand, though, it, it does get a lot harder, and especially with normie types, neurotypical types. They'll just go off and do their own thing, and they'll just kind of you'll you'll be left on dust. Especially if you, you know, you make the decision or, or life has decided for you that you're going to be on your own, you're going to die alone, then. It, it, it does get a lot harder. So not just in the case of sort of dating, but it's not advice. I hate advice. You know, I say advice is, advice, advice is the worst advice, but trying to find relationships that you can solidify with humans in general, friendships, etc. is, you know, take advantage of those critical periods of time in your life, which isn't to say that they, you won't grow apart. That happens, but you might as well take advantage when it's there because... All right. It's, it, I can guarantee you, it will dissipate. It will dissipate, and you can be in a situation where, you know, with the building I live in, I don't know a single soul. Nobody talks to anybody. There's no, yeah. when I was growing up, my parents had neighbors that would pick up the mail when, um, you know, my family went on vacation or something, right? I was a kid. They'd hold the mail. I mean, I, <laughs> who would trust anyone to do that these days, let alone, you know, the people just aren't there. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm kind of forced <laughs> to cite Shakespeare here. You know, Polonius, the father of Leotes, is about to send his son off to Denmark. He says, you know, those friends you have, their adoption tried, grapple unto them with hoops of, uh, hoops of steel. Or grapple unto their souls with hoops of steel. I mean, it's just, I can't really drive home this point enough. You know, if you are young, you're in a position to socialize, get to know, not just for the sake of women, just social human bonds, take advantage of it because it gets harder and harder the older you get. And yeah. even if you're working in an office environment, which I don't, even then you're there to primarily do work, not socialize. So then yeah. the best case scenario is you'll be that guy and you leave and, you know, if something happens to you, you're like, oh, where's, where's wherever, you know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't get easier. So something to bear in mind. Yep, and that's even highlighted more so by the fact that because people are subbing the internet for developing actual communication skills, um, that makes it even worse. I mean, like how these all oh, you got all these kids nowadays, they're just texting and typing and texting and typing. It's like, could they pick up on body language? Can they pick up on tonality and inflections? Can they pick up on this stuff? Probably not. So again, it makes it even more difficult. Like school is the window. That's where you are developing these skills, building these relationships in real life. Because again, like you just said, after college, what do you got? Work. That's like the one place where you have constant social circle. And we just said, don't dip the pen in company ink. It's, it's just a bad idea especially if it's you, the man, pursuing her, really bad idea, speaking from experience there. Um, but I guess if she's pursuing you, use your judgment. My mom has a friend. Um, her son got married to someone that he worked with, but she pursued him. So, again, there, there was that. Kind that's, of... that's permissible. You know, women are allowed to bend the rules all the time, as we know. Correct. So, but if you pursue her and she doesn't feel the same way, you're in HR. Correct. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, but, I, yeah, and I think that, I mean, I guess I'm fortunate and unfortunate it's not unfortunate, to, to, to be as old as I am because I did learn and acquire certain social skills. And if I needed to, I could probably you know, reignite them. But it is a puzzling, a, a curious question. You know, if, if, all, if you're, say you're born in 2003 or whatever, and all you know is, is this existence, uh, what, what's that like? You know, and, and, and will you or have you developed these skills? I've seen a lot of people comment and some people are, are very sanguine about it and just think, well, you know, this is the new social format and this is how people interact henceforth. And other people are sort of worried that there's some major milestone has been missed and it's going to forever change, uh, not oh, yeah. just the landscape, but people's actual psychology and neurology. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I would say that something has been lost. Um, the the, the nonverbal stuff is being lost like tone of voice and body language, mm. you know, just because, just because they say, oh, this is the new mode of communication doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> it 
just because you know just because you know you, you'd rather text your friend doesn't mean you shouldn't give them a phone call every once in a while or spend time with them in person every once in a while you know and i think that's lost on a on a lot of people for sure because those types of in-person connections are very very important and think about it are you really surprised that if you can't have those types of connections with your friends on a platonic basis that you also can't have those connections on a romantic basis with someone from the opposite sex i mean it all shit rolls downhill as the saying goes right yeah i think there's a real risk to the whole online thing and and we have to admit i mean everyone knows that a lot of online, all of the dating goes on online. A lot of it is, and so there are all these other factors that you, you just hmm, that you can't really take into account, right? So yeah. I'm so if I were a young guy uh, these days, I don't know what exactly what I would do, but there are certain things that don't jive well. Like you know, you might have a fabulous conversation with some female online, and maybe yeah. many such ones. But that turns out, you know, she's a neat freak and you're not, or vice versa, right? Yeah. Now, if you're thinking anything long term, that's a recipe for disaster because I'm very messy, unfortunately. It's just, I just hate cleaning more than anything else in existence. I force myself when it's absolutely necessary, right? Yeah. And uh, I've had conflict with that. Uh, I've had conflict with housemate. And then, you know, I'm not, I don't blame them. You know, I'm, I get it. If you're naturally inclined to be neat, then. <laughs> Um, that, those are things that you just wouldn't pick up online. So you might if, you imagine having some online thing and then you meet up a couple of, t like three times in a year and everything's great. And like, let's move in. Then it turns out one individual is a neat freak and has to clean every other day. And the other one cleans once a month. And then like, the little, little things like that, that people don't, I mean, that's what makes it, people don't realize that, you know, especially with women, right? A lot of, <laughs> there's a joke, uh, you know, the reason why, uh, the reason why she divorced him is because he forgot to pick up the milk at the grocery store, right? Uh, yeah, the idea, the idea that um, that these little things are really what's going to cause the tension. And yeah. The thing is, though, um, a lot the part that a lot of dudes aren't told because they watch they watch the Disney movies and you know it's a happy ending and then the credits roll. They don't tell you what happens after the credits roll and the honeymoon phase is over. There's that's, no incentive for Hollywood to do that, right? I mean, correct. And that's when all this stuff comes to a head. Like, it's like, okay, all right, show's over, honeymoon phase is over, now we're getting used to each other, tell us how you really feel. And it's like, yeah, more often than not, it's not pleasant. In fact, one, that's one of the major causes of divorce, that women feeling that men are not contributing to the household chores enough. Yeah, that's a, actually one of the causes cited. Well, you know, he wasn't doing the dishes and da 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 and whatever. I mean, mind you, yeah. oftentimes women aren't really being cognizant of the fact that the guy is working himself to the bones at a, at a job full-time or even in overtime, but still. Correct. Uh, but if, she, if she's working full-time too, then I would say maybe yeah. she has a little more basis. But if she's like stay-at-home mom and she's saying that, it's like... Nah. Yeah, it, de it depends on the situation, obviously. But there are of these course. little things that... I, and in my eyes, I, I, I had a brief period of cohabitation with a female. and Yeah, I mean... I remember one of my first, probably my first longest term relationship went almost three years. I've talked about this on my channel. This is a, yet another female with the enormous Jugosauri who was insane in bed, which, you know, as a young 19, early 20 something, I, I thought, well, this is, this is like, <laughs> amazing, right? I mean, never mind that she had, was a, kind of a psychopath and did a lot of crazy things like throw dishes at me and stuff. I was like, well, at the time, it didn't really matter. I was like, because <laughs> you know uh she sucks a mean one and i mean she cooks and, who, and she, look at her they're so big right who, who cares right but um right. she had other habits which for example she had this hang up about how i folded my clothing if i even bothered to and so she would just go into my own closet in my own room and just take everything out and chuck it on the floor and we get in a fight about that i think that that's just something you don't get from an online i mean you're not seeing how a person lives and these are things to i guess it's definitely things to consider because if you're in it for some sort of long haul situation then yeah. uh you have to spend time together you have to get to know the person you can't just make assumptions based on you know what you see in a bio or something like yeah that. It's, and i've just seen this time and again you know i have some close friends that i would never inflict myself upon them i mean it was just say if they absolutely needed a place to stay, they could, but they know that I'm a, that I'm a messy slob, and right. they are not. You know, they know that. I mean, I make it very abundantly clear. They've uh, most of my close friends have seen my place, so 
it is what it is. Uh, and it, yeah, just don't get little things like that. Um, and that's important, unfortunately, these, these little details in terms of sort of compatibilities, right? Um, because there's only so much you can do to really modulate your natural tendencies, right? Because I, my, both my parents are obsessed with neatness and orderliness, and I, I have no idea why I've never been. I couldn't tell you. It's just net. I don't know. No idea. So. Yeah. I, I wish I were. I wish I were, but I'm not. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I agree. But I did want to ask you, you know, as one former New Yorker to a, I guess, a lifelong New Yorker, uh, ask you about New York City. Well, my view of New York City is that a lot of people get stuck in a bubble there and they think it's the only place on earth pretty much because they're, well, literally living in this bubble. Right. But I think it's not a nice place at all to either grow up or to live. And I think people make do, they quote unquote cope, right? But I know probably has never occurred to you to leave, but to, you get used to certain things, sure, right? But do you really think it's a nice place? I'm curious. Well, I hate Manhattan. Mm. I hate Manhattan with a passion. Okay. It's just, Why is that? I don't like the I don't like the the hustle and rustle or whatever you want to call it. I just I, I just um, I don't really care for it. And um, I tend to hold the view that the more populated an area is, the more desensitized and depersonalized the population is. Yeah. Right. So that I'm I'm not really a fan of Manhattan. It's to me it's just a bunch of really pretentious people who think they're more important than they actually are. And I don't really care for for Manhattan in particular. Um, I kind of steer. Cl- clear of the Bronx, um, that haven't really spent a lot of time in Queens and Staten Island. Um, you know, I don't really go there either. So Brooklyn Why do you has... steer clear in the Bronx? I grew up there. It's such a delightful place. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not what I heard. Uh, <laughs> so I say it might maybe minus like a couple of neighborhoods up there that are like up and coming, but I, I tend to steer clear of that Brooklyn has been primarily where I, uh, I've been. And I got to tell you, Brooklyn's very different from Manhattan and a lot of these other places. Um, because again, it's just more grounded people. You're going to find a lot of different cultures in Brooklyn and things like this, but for the most part, you know, yeah, it's, it's not bad in Brooklyn, I I would say. But, um, yeah, I think when people think like, oh, you know, it's just like this sterile robotic, you know, like, um, social farm. I I think what they're really talking about is Manhattan. That that's kind of how I look at it. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I've never had complaints about Brooklyn. And honestly, even if Brooklyn did get to a point where it's like, all right, I can't deal with this anymore, my home is still my sanctuary. I still have this. Right. And, you know, I have family here and things like that. So leaving never occurred to me. Mm. Never occurred to me to leave. Um, because, again, I, I can really spend time by myself for prolonged periods of time, and it's like, it's okay, you know? But, um, you know, I, I can see why some people would look at it. It's like, all right, if you live like in the Bronx, yeah. Or if you live in Manhattan, it's just like, ugh, like there's like no human connection here. It's like a it's like a real reflection of the Internet basically walking around you. And it's like, all right, yeah, I got to get out of here. I don't blame people who reach that conclusion. It's just that in Brooklyn, man, I never really experienced that, which is why I always kind of contrast this. I'm like, look, just because you're seeing all this stuff we're talking about on the internet, it doesn't mean you shouldn't go out into the real world and experience some stuff because, uh, you know, yeah, there's, that's, there's still interesting people out there. That's fine. I, I can't help but think that there's some sort of borough-driven bias there. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if... I'm not, I'd, I'd be the last person to defend the Bronx. I'm not a fan, but it's fundamentally different in the Bronx or Queens uh, to Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I certainly get that. I mean, what always annoyed me was commuting to work and having to ride the subway for endless amounts of time. Uh, not a fan of the crime. Uh, I was, uh, been mugged before, you know, things of that nature, but on the point, so I don't know, I guess it is, if you feel that you have a, a nice sanctuary there, I, I, I totally get it, but I just remember just wanting to get out pretty much ASAP the minute I could. And, uh, yeah, not, not my, uh, favorite place on earth. Uh, yeah. and I truly wish I had grown up elsewhere, but, uh, that is, you know, you don't choose where you're born. So, 
True, true. I think also growing up in the family I grew up in, I think that probably, like you said, you know, there's a bias there. I think it colors my perception of things in a positive light. Again, because, you know, I was the kind, I was probably like the the last generation where it's like kids still went outside and played. You know, we had the neighborhood friends. We we did things like this. You know, in the 90s, we had the Pokemon Link Cable Battles. Then Yu-Gi-Oh! got big. We dueled with our decks and all this stuff. You know, like we we had stuff like that. Yeah. And, and and now, again, it doesn't really matter where you are. It's all the same. Just cyber, like, ugh, I can't talk to you in person. Get away from me type crap. No matter where you go in the world, it's like, ugh. Well, that, that's... To your point, we've talked about this before, I think, that the internet has had this distorting effect, I think, to some degree, whereas, you know, people get just hyper, especially in the black pill and lookism, right, hyper caught up in that. Yeah. The point where, look, you know, I live in a reasonably large city, I won't say exactly where, but reasonably large, I see what is sometimes described as oofy dude, basically average people with, you know, average looking women with average looking men in yes, relationships. Sir. I don't. Mm-hmm. The, whereas, if you were to go by the logic and the claims of a lot of the black pillars and a lot of lookism communities, that's just impossible. If a guy's a five, it's over, right? Right. And Which it's you have to refine it. You have to refine the view. Yeah. You have. To, yeah, because obviously there is a basic looks test, and if you fail the looks test, then yes, what lookism says is true, of course. But the problem is, well, what defines failing the looks test? You have a lot of normies who think they fail the looks test, and it's like, no, nah, you probably pass. You just you need to get out of your house. <laughs> but again, some people, again, because they don't have the intrinsic motivation, they'll lump themselves in with like a genuine sub five where they've tried, and they'll basically use that as justification for inaction. But I also, do that, but yeah. But also one of the other factors that the people who tend to have success, both the one, males and females, are the ones who spend less time online. So they're not, you know, twenty four seven on Discord or twenty four seven on YouTube. That's they cool. they have email, maybe uh, Facebook, maybe they play an online game occasionally, but they're not so absorbed in it. And that's yeah. kind of the problem because the the people who are hyper obsessed about you know every every point on the on the scale of lookism are the people who are just consuming voraciously these videos right. and they're just, they're not going to be the type of people that are going to see, get the, the sort of normy opportunities that, uh, why am I using it? Well, I'll just use your terminology. The average, the opportunities of an average guy, the women, I, I see it all the time, you know, average looking people together in relationships. If that's what you want, it's eminently possible, assuming you, you know, base your average looking. Um, but, you're going to have to make steer clear of the people who spend, including the women that spend a lot of time online because then they're going to you know, have distorted views and of yeah. what's re- reasonable and what's not. And I think this is this is twofold, right? The first one is is something that I covered in one of my videos, the variant, not the variances video, the um the LM the LV SMV RMV video where basically what I talked about is like, okay, if you pass the looks test, this gives you the opportunity to showcase your non-physical factors, which means you have to (laughs) leave the house, right? And you showcase those factors, and that could make up for the fact that maybe you're just average in looks versus the sub five, they legitimately fail the test, right? Um, And Chad has the halo effect, which means like, you know, he's going to get a lot more um, screw ups before he gets put on the chopping block. The other side of it is oofy doofy, which is, you know, a form of social engineering that kind of has the effect on the hive mind on what's conventionally attractive versus what's not conventionally attractive. For example, European imperialism, right? That had an effect on conventional attractive standards when they there was imperialism in Africa and the rest of the world and things like this, right? So when we're looking at that in uh, modern times, what you're seeing is, you know, a newer school of thought where we're really honing in on this neurotypical versus neurodivergent, right? Because I'm noticing that a lot of the people that struggle are neurodivergent. They're the ones that really, really struggle with connecting with humans in general in a meaningful way. And I think a lot of these average Joes are probably just neurotypical people. They're just, they're just average shows. Like exactly, and they're also not spending you know seven hours a day watching YouTube videos. They might watch a funny YouTube video for 10 or 15 minutes, and they just get on with their day. Correct. Yeah, yeah. and again, this is why, I, again, I, the running joke, I don't get invited to gatherings. Women don't want to talk about space exploration. 
There yeah. may be neurologically divergent women who want to talk about spatial exploration, but there's a reason that the majority of the STEM is basically conducted by men. There's a yeah. reason for that, right? Yeah. So again, yes, you could still find something if you're neurologically divergent, but again, you're going to have a much more uphill battle than the neurotypical person. And I think that's one big part of what Oofy Doofy really drives at to explain how these average guys get girlfriends because they put themselves out there and they show their non-physical factors that make up for the fact that they're average looking. And the girls are like, all right, I can get on board with that. And it probably helps that a lot of these girls in these relationships probably don't have um, ridiculous social media consumption as well. Yep. Uh, again, you tend to be, you're not on the internet all the time. You tend to have more realistic standards. But yeah, when you question. are on the internet all the time, it gets warped. So I think people like Wheat Waffles, what they do is they say, like, look, there's a lot of girls on the internet with this sense of entitlement and stuff like this. But it ain't all of them. It's definitely not. So, again, I think, you know, when you want to just to tie the knot on this, when you want to get back to the whole A-Walt, Nay-Walt dichotomy, I think E-Walt is more accurate. Enough women are like that, that this is becoming a problem. But is it a universal problem? No, not even close. Because remember, yeah, 50% of the time it ends in divorce. But what about the other 50? Yeah, sure, a portion of them may be unhappy marriages. Che cheaper to keep her. <laughs> yeah. Right. But even within that 50%, there's probably like maybe 15 to 20%. Again, this is arbitrary, right? No. But, you know, I read Aaron Clary's book of numbers. Um, you can check out that book if you want to. Hmm. And basically, he kind of did the math and it was like, you know, it's like a 15% chance that probably you're in a happy marriage, right? So it's like, okay, yeah. Not the, the best odds, to be fair, but yeah, still. All right. The odds are still low, but the point is it exists. And yeah. then you have people who are very absolutist with their prescription saying, no, it does not. And it's like, well, that's just not true. And the same is true with lookism. Yes, there's information in lookism that has merit. Absolutely, which is why I cover it. But again, you have to have open minds to things like Oofy Doofy and things like this. Because again, at the end of the day, what we want to do when we're giving the information is we want to account for as many of these situations as possible so that when you see it in action, it's like, all right, I, I kind of know what's going on here and where I fit in all this. Yeah. Yeah. Because knowing the information is half the battle. Devising a solution that's tailored to yourself, having that intrinsic motivation, that's the other half. Yeah. And, you know, final qu well, series of questions, or this is sort of the, arguably the most important. So my, many of you might, might have noticed, uh, that the sign of Dada frequently in his videos will have something called N7, and some sort of uh, apparel on with N7, which stands. You're the well, I know what it stands for, but what, what, why don't you tell everyone what N7 stands for? So yeah, that is a the N7 is a special forces from a video game franchise called the um, called Mass Effect. It's the human special forces N is the designation for special forces and it can range from one to seven seven is the highest you can achieve um so basically the main character of the trilogy commander shepherd is an n7 and that's right that's what and see pete here clearly has great interest in that because I've, I've caught him uh well caught him i've observed him playing even mass effect andromeda which uh you know not everyone has a favorable opinion of that but i've you know clearly you must like it on some level to play it right currently doing a playthrough of it on i'm PC. aware I've, I've seen you yes so uh it's um it begs the question i mean bioware in general i think more broadly the, the the bq the bioware question the bwq um you know i've been playing bioware games since the 90s you could say because baldur's gate and those games have been uh well i mean they were made by bioware right the I think effectively to sort of cut to the chase, Bioware. So what's happened is we have this situation where you still have a developer or company with a name, right? They're called they're called Bioware. Now, if they're right. called Bioware, then that makes you recollect and think, oh well, that's the cup that made Dragon Age Origins or Mass the Mass Effect trilogy or whatever. Yes. But you could have a complete exchange and really just turnover of the of the personnel who are actually the developers working on the game which has happened as you're probably well aware without um without the name changing so a lot of people have gotten really attached to this label of bioware you know even though all it is is a name at this stage there's just nothing really with bioware of mid 2022 
has almost nothing to do with the Bioware of, say, 2012, let alone 2008 or 2009. And Correct. I've seen tons of people just again and again, after one failure you know, the anthem, one failure after the other, just pinning their hopes that this is going to be the time when they knock it out of the park. And I'm too old and too cynical and just, I just think too, too accurate about this to realize that, look, yeah. If it happens, it'll be a bloody miracle. But that Bioware is gone. So when you saw, I'm sure you've seen the trailer where they feature Liara picking up the N7 insignia from, you know, course. right? Um, how it's not over and blah, blah, blah. And I actually sent you an article where, just I guess they're trying to keep the franchise alive. They, they talk about which ending would be canon. Whatever comes out in the future regarding Mass Effect, in addition to Dragon Age, I mean, don't I, I used to be a huge fan as well of Dragon Age. It's not going to be what it used to be. It will be filled with all the things that we've come to expect. A lot right. of political correctness, a lot of, I'd argue, yeah. un, unnecessary political insertions that really don't contribute to the story. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's just gone, and it's very sad to me because, you know, I must have played through the trilogy back in the day I have the Legendary Edition, never played through it, but I played through the original trilogy, geez, at least five times, maybe six times. Played uh, at least Dragon Age Origins three or four times, maybe even more. I uh, played, played all the Dra Dragon Age, actually, but that yeah. was for most. Dragon um, Age, I played too. Yeah. Yeah. The, th these were great games, uh, really great role playing experiences, and yet, you know, I think we need to make our peace with the fact that Bioware, it's just a name now. You know, if maybe, I don't know, uh, maybe there's some brand name company that used to like a lot and their product has changed. Well, they still call themselves that, but yeah. it's just not, it's not the same thing. And so I think it really sucks a lot. I mean, I want to look forward to a resurrection of the Mass Effect, the Mass Effect franchise as, as, any, as much as anyone else does, or Dragon Age. Like, you know, Dragon Age Inquisition, I don't know if you played it, I assume you did, uh, of left off, I mean... Actually, Trespasser, which was the last DLC, was pretty good overall. Um, yeah, I which that one. It was quite, you know, obviously the big revelation. No spoilers here, but imagine if that had been integrated in the main game, or the whole main game had been a story like that, and pretty, been a pretty good game. But left, left on a cliffhanger. Okay, what they're, they're not, I mean, there's so much turnover, so many mistakes happening. Will they release something in Mass Effect called Mass Effect? Yeah, probably. Or Dragon Age? Yeah, probably. Will it bear any resemblance to the games that were so beloved and you know popular and uh, maybe vaguely, but not much? And right. it's it's just gone. It's over. I hate to say it. I loved Mass the Mass Effect. I, I fell in love about it. I played so much of that online multiplayer. It was great. I made builds and, and guides and uh, to all to all sorts of wacky combinations and yeah, Mass Effect uh, Three multiplayer. I love it. I love it. Oh, I, 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 yeah, I used to play. Uh, I mean, I like I said, I had a, I had a, a channel where I talk about the, you know, I was just, it was great, it was great, and it was very organic too. As I realized, I just kind of came up with this thing and just hit the world by storm, and it was just really, really fun co-op. Uh, in my, to my mind, never, never been replicated since. But no. it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like reminiscing about anything in the past. I mean, every uh, bands that make music and albums, right? They have their heyday. But sure. you know, typically, 20, 30 years later, they're not really as great as they... Maybe they're okay, and for the diehard fans, it's fine. And they're these diehard Bioware fans, but I mean, <laughs> there's this channel on YouTube called Bioware Fan. And you can tell... You can tell by... You know, the guy who runs the channel is probably not straight, and also probably of certain political persuasions, but, you know, whatever. And um, that's fine. But it's, you know, I, I lament the loss of Bioware too. But it, you know, to, to actually believe, just because they made it back then, I'm, I'm rambling and ranting a lot. But I, was, I don't, I don't want them this to be true. I want, yeah. I want fun escapism too. You know, I want something I can really, I mean, I want a relationship like Liara again, or uh, you know, a bromance like Garrus is possibly my favorite character in the entire. You know, the trilogy it's a great guy all you know across the board right yeah, never forget that shooting scene in the uh, in the citadel right whatever whatever you you know your relationship with him you know it's, it's great yeah um but you know it's 
Yeah, There's, I don't think I don't think it stinks for me as much as it does for you because I wasn't with like probably Mass Effect was like the first Bioware game that I actually played. Oh, okay. So again, I'm not as invested as you were, maybe like from Baldur's Gate, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Related now, so like you're and you've played, you've been through Knights of the Old Republic, you you know you've been through Jade Empire possibly, you know yeah. games that I never really touched. So again, you're you're a lot more invested in the company. I was, but, yes, but, yes. Yeah. But I, I look honestly, even Mass Effect Andromeda, yes, it's very different from what the trilogy was. And it wasn't meant to be a carbon copy of the trilogy. It was in some respects. Um, but in other things, there there were some very interesting plot points in the game. And that, that's kind of what keeps me going. Like, like for example, the Remnant Builders. Who are those guys? Like, you know, like that that mm. kind of stuff is interesting to me. I did a playthrough, I remember. the com- uh, I think they, 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 they sp- the combat was quite interesting with the jetpacks and... You know, there are certain things, but on top of that, you know, not to get overly critical, but in a technical sense, the release was just, I don't know. Yeah, it's all it, patched up now, but it's it, unacceptable that the game needed that many do, patches. Do you remember the, the famous one uh, God, with, the, with the bug eyes? It was like... Uh, My face is tired. <laughs> My face is tired, right. Uh, so I guess, when did it come out? 2016, 17? Which one? 17. Did, yeah. yeah. So it, It's much better now. Oh, of much. course it is. Of course it is. I mean, obviously it's been passionate. for a lot of people, sadly. Yeah. Yeah, I... I yeah, I, I get that. Um, but I... You know, I, I... I'm not going to lie. The Mass Effect trilogy was probably the last video game... Not that I enjoyed. I've enjoyed a lot. And it's not even my favorite video game. But I would say... It's not a game. It's three, right? But that trilogy was the last... I'll call it a game. Last game... That I had a deep emotional investment in, you know, I really, really cared about the plot. It just really, just it really mattered to me. The characters mattered to me. Not all of them in equal measure, but um, you know, yeah. just. The, the, I mean, who, who? I mean, at times she could be a bit of a, a biatch, but you know, Liara. I mean, I think is every guy's dream. Who wouldn't want a, a girl like Liara, right? Right. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually, uh, uh, Miranda, that, that, that's mine. Oh, well, okay. Fair enough. But, but I guess we're in agreement that we, uh, both leave, uh, Ashley to die in Vermeer, uh, because, <laughs> because that's it's just what that, you're supposed to do, right? It's a, oh, here, the one, the running joke is, oh yeah, that girl, that girl. Yeah. She's Ash huh, on Vermeer. Yeah, um, ex- exactly. Yeah. But, um, no, it depends on the playthrough. Generally when I play as bro Shep, I tend to save Ashley, but when I play as fem Shep, I tend to save Caden. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I played a lot of fem Shep too. Uh, I actually liked Gareth so much. I decided to romance him as well, just cause I think it was a good experience. I mean, I'm not gay, but it was a good experience. I like, I mean, Garrus is a great character, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, probably, probably my favorite male character. Um, in the game, like in the first game, is probably Rex. I like Rex. Rex is pretty decent, yeah, yeah. But I, yeah. I think, you know, it, for me, it was just the last one I really had an emotional attachment to, and after that, it was just, eh. I still have fun playing video games. They have games that I enjoy a lot, but I wouldn't. Yeah. It was. It didn't really kind of just, you know, pack me. Just kind of, just, just kind of really get hold of that, those emotional buttons and press them all in the right way, where I just sort of. I don't know. Yeah, it, I know. I know what you mean, but probably like on um, like diving into the lore and stuff like that type of thing. I like Halo a lot. I'm a big fan of Halo. I've actually want, never played Halo. Uh, I know about it, but I've never played it. I tend to yeah. play a lot of RPGs that are more sort of isometric. I'm into lore, but Halo I've never uh, actually played. I probably should. Halo's uh, got about thirty plus novels they wrote, so that's how okay. expansive lore is. There, okay, but, that's um, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I also play Metal Gear. I like Metal Gear. Big okay. Fan of that. Yeah. Um, Dragon Age, of course, and um, yeah, the the, uh, the Shin Megami Tensei franchise, which I got into through Persona, which is like a sub series of Shin Megami Tensei. I've seen. I I mean, part of that issue for me is I think I just I missed the age cutoff to get into anime and that sort of thing. So it's just, you know, I have close friends who are really, really much younger who are really into anime. And I, I've tried the samples. I just, I have no connection to it. You know, whatever. To be honest with you, I, I wasn't really a JRPG guy either. But you know, mm. uh, I, Persona is like those games. They're just so well made that I'm just like, yeah, oh, I have, yeah. I have to play these. And then I just kept going. I started with five, and I was like, all right, I got to play four. All right, mm. I got to play 
like three. And then before you know it, I played all of them. And then I just said, all right, what else did these guys make? And it was like, oh, Shin Megami Tensei. And so just because you, you think there's a cutoff doesn't mean you shouldn't attempt to go down. I, I might I might check it out. Um... I, I do warn you, though, that if you're looking to get physical copies of a lot of these games, uh, the older ones, they're, they yeah. ain't cheap. I probably wouldn't. I'm I'm fine with digital stuff if I ever get around to it. But uh, no, no, yeah, no. unfortunately, I think it's not just general. I mean, Bioware. I think a lot of the there's a kind of organic factor that ever since gaming, particularly sort of role playing gaming, action RPGs have gotten really popular. They're sort of just sort of left the uh, the scene, you know. And I, it's just a consequence of getting popular. If anything gets popular, then that sort of original feeling to it is, is lost which is okay i guess but yeah uh, if it, if it were up to me i think um sooner or later bioware should just make like a final mass effect game and then stop because you risk milking the cow and then just making a bunch of bad games so i think right now again in the trailer it shows both galaxies so it's kind of been inferred that like both galaxies maybe will kind of be in it like maybe you'll play as liara for like the first half of the game and then it will cut over to tell you what's happening in andromeda at the same time or something like this well and they should just answer all the questions and just just leave it at that. That that's what I would do personally, but I'm not the writer there. So yeah. there's an interesting video that was made. Um, it's sort of part of the issue is sort of these large gaps between games. So you have this, and the guy was drawing the analogy of sort of Warhammer, which I've never I played a little bit, never really got into it. But Warhammer has all sorts of games that are released regularly, right? This is this ongoing thing. It's part of a bigger setting. Right. Whereas if things like Dragon Age or Mass Effect, where you're just waiting years and years, you know, hopes building up, and you want some, you really want it to be great, and then it just disappoints. I would agree with you, you know, make a final one, or just or just leave it. You know, I there's no. Well, no I, I do want closure. Like I do want them to answer the questions, and I think honestly, at the end of the Mass Effect trilogy, they answered all the questions within the Milky Way. I think they like, did, yeah. And I feel like now it's like, okay, Andromeda didn't really pan out the way we hoped. So now we got to go back to the Milky Way. And now they're going to do, they're going to backpedal and canonize a decision unless they're willing to basically make three separate games, if they're willing to do that, um, built yeah. into one. You know, whether or not we have the technology to do that, that's logistics. But again, this, the implications of those three choices, it's like, it's, it's so different across the board. So for all we know, maybe that is what they're doing. And this, the trailer just showcases one. Of three, maybe. That's probably more hopeful than... Do you... I'm sure you're aware of the original ending, right? That was planned and what happened, right? The uh, Drew Karpishan Dark Energy ending? Yeah. 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 Um, from what I understand, like, really deep diving into that, that was on the cutting room floor. They, like, they, they were considering it. Well... Um, yeah, but there's also this. a lot... Of, yeah, there's a lot of seeds throughout the series that... Just as many seeds that were planted for the organic versus synthetic thing as there was for the Dark Energy thing. And I think by the end, they were just kind of like, all right, we got to pick one of these. Well, that's not, yeah, that's partially true. But what actually happened is they, they definitely were leaning more towards the dark energy one. And there was a leak. And basically, they thought, well, people know that dark energy is involved. Let's just scrap the whole idea. When I think it would have just been a much more interesting conflict of interest to have that. You know, the, the, the Reapers are, are there to to regulate this cosmic force, this strange thing. But yeah, it, it, as far as I'm aware at the time, and the leak wasn't such that, oh, we, this is what happens exactly. It's more like, oh yeah, there's dark energy and the Reapers are somehow involved. Think, oh no, well, let's complete. That's what I had read repeatedly had happened. Now, yeah. maybe that's incorrect. I don't know. But... Yeah, I, mean, I probably have to look into it more, but um, I think at the end of the day, if you just look at the mods, for the game mm -hmm. happy ending mods and things like this some people just wanted closure with shepherd and they tried with the citadel dlc they tried um and modders are kind of working around that but um i think at the end of the day if you're just looking at the game on the face regardless of whether you had a decision where it's like okay go through with destroying the reapers and risk dark energy putting us in a big crunch or sacrifice humanity so that the big crunch can be delayed or maybe the the crucible would be like this thing that stops the big crunch permanently but you have to sacrifice your own race or something like this that would still probably leave a bad taste in fans mouths the same way that um these three choices do because again there is no um 
there's no positive feeling like there was at the end of the first two games. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like there, there was no, there was no, um, there was no payoff because again, there's a character Javik throughout the game. It's like, how yeah. far are you willing to go to achieve your goal? What are you willing to sacrifice? Yeah. And I, and I think Mass Effect 3 was always meant to kind of have this like um, melancholy, like down mood compared to Andromeda, which obviously they tried to do a 180 and make it much more upbeat and hopeful. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't think honestly making a dark energy ending would have made a difference. To be interesting. Honest. That's an interesting perspective. Fair enough. I'm, I'm, I hadn't actually considered that, but I, I, I'm, I'm always willing to revise my views. And it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. The final point about Bioware is having observed just how things have changed over the decades. Bioware was really the int- entry point, in my opinion, for female kind to enter in games and, and not give their quote unquote input on a lot of things. Precisely right. because Bioware is so social and had all these relationships, and that's really what women kind of homed in on uh, when it came to these games in, yeah. in general. And yeah. in a lot of ways, Bioware kind of started it all. Now, <laughs> I don't know how much I have a lot to say about. Was that was that a good idea? Mm, I don't know. It's, I mean, from well, a from a financial perspective, it is. You want more people to buy your games, so yeah, you want women buying I mean, your look, games too. Look at Dragon Age. Majority of people yeah. who play Dragon Age are women. I didn't know it was a majority. Is it really a majority? Really? Okay. I, I, I know for sure on Dragon Age Inquisition, the majority oh. of the player base is women. I know that for sure. Well, of but, course, because non-Chad looking Chad Solis, right? <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah. But at the at the end of the day, um, that inevitably is going to drive them back to play Origins and Dragon yeah. Age 2 more. So again, I definitely think uh, in my experience operating in both fan bases, there's a lot more women in Dragon Age. Oh yeah, I mean, I've have like you seen the, the stupid Alistair romance marriage mods? Uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah. This is what they want. Again, again, what what is this escapism a reflection of? What we can't have in real life. <laughs> well, that's what it is. So yeah. it's like a lot, a lot of them, you know, they they don't have these things in real life, so they they're escaping too, but in, in a different way. Yeah. But and it's a fascinating kind of topic because I've I've always kind of seen that tension in the escapism between men and women because now we have this open you know everyone plays games including women right and I just noticed that you know as a guy I like story see hmm, how should I put this I think it's an important point to make so I want a good story right and Thanks. individuals are great you know you want funny witty characters and you know garris cracking his jokes he's my personal favorite like i said or whatever um that's fine but i'm okay with all that being subordinated to the greater plot like they're they're characters in a universe or a setting and that's fine so i want the overarching story to take precedence i don't want frankly speaking all this pc garbage to be inserted I don't want extra stuff to be there to you know cater to certain people to make themselves you know, I don't feel better about themselves. I don't care about that stuff. Give me a good story. Uh, if you want to create political tension and conflict, do so within the story, which was you know the case with like Ferelden or Orlay in the case of Dragon Age Origins, or I don't know Solarians and the Krogan not getting along for obvious reasons. Um, but I think that one of the influences of, I can't prove this, obviously it's, it's a theory and I I have no concrete proof. One of the, um, factors that one of the things that's been created through the influence of women and, and, and RPGs in particular has been this overemphasis on, on sort of internal romance, kind of interpersonal character development, which I think is important but I think should be subordinated to the greater story ultimately. And I think women care a lot less about the greater story. And certainly they care a lot less about game mechanics. Let's face it. Like what cool combination, you know, personally, I always liked the engineer a lot. I liked having that combat drone and, you know, zapping them. It was just fun. Women care a lot less about that. Um, They tend to play on lower difficulties depending on, you know, they don't want. So that has an effect, right? That means that overall the combat's going to be made, you know, less challenging. It's also going to have this effect that, yeah, it's, it's women really, that's you know, some aspects been called a space opera. Well, women really want that soap opera in a game. And right. it's, they, they're told, like, I look at the way the mods, they're women modders. And on average, they make sort of cosmetic mods, you know, different dresses, the characters, that, that's fine. But there's to say so that many. <laughs> there's so many, right. That has an effect on the overall development of the game. Yeah. I think on you know for for a male player base, and I happen to be a male, 
Um, the effect of women's involvement in uh, these sorts of games has been probably not the most beneficial um, because you end up having to cater to very different creatures, as it were, with different interests and different um, different things they want to see in the game. You can try to incorporate a lot of it, but I think you end up kind of losing out. And, you know, Bioware was always walking a fine line, but I just notice increasingly a lot of companies who make RPGs tend to do this, although not exclusively. Uh, and I think that, I don't know, it just... Obviously, I understand the motivation because, you know, you, women pay for games, too. They make money, too. Good for them. Okay. At the same time, um, I think part of, in addition to all the politically correct stuff and, you know, just real-life politics becoming an unnecessary component of games, there's that, right. too. And you can, yeah, you can you can definitely see the uh, the influence. And it's, um, I there's always that argument I hear that, well, you know, it's your if once you buy it, it's your game. You can do whatever you want. That's true, but if the development of the game itself, so for example, uh, uh, there's a game called Baldur's Gate Three. Not necessarily recommending it. It's an early access, and right. the male. I, 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 it, it can't be a coincidence. The male models are kind of chat. They have the, you know the, the max. Everything's going for them, right? The female models. Looked like they they were taking testosterone injections half the time, right? <laughs> so you're thinking like you're looking at this. I, this I, I, you've seen this pattern too often in games these days. You're thinking why why does the guys all look really good? I mean, I uh, I'll send you some later after we're done, it, just to get to give a sense of this. But it's just and the the way I, I have to use mods to find you know decently. I, I get the, to find decently attractive female character models. Why is yeah. that? Well. Well, it's the, it's the strike back at all those years where the men over-sexualized women in video games. Right? Yeah. That's kind of their get back. But you have to understand very much like how these games are geared towards women. The games back then were geared towards men. So it's like... Absolutely. Yeah. But you have to understand that like a lot of these companies, you think they have an agenda, this, that, and the third. It's like, no, nah, they're in it for the money. That's why. It's well, obviously, and I know, yeah, I don't... I, I think Well, I think some of them sincerely believe in a lot of the PC stuff that we've... Uh, you know, we've come to know and identify, but yeah, yeah ultimately yeah. women. But yeah. But the, the, some that believe it, their job is to go to the person who cares about the bottom line and convince them that it's worth putting in for the bottom line. That that's, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, without question. I think that's, that's true. And yeah. women are a pain demographic. And so they're going to get the stuff that they want. And Correct. it's, I guess they're trying to meet everyone in the middle, but you know, as a male consumer, I, uh, I miss the good old days a little bit. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're we're all eating those member berries a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. It it's you know you, you roll you roll with the punches, but I think that a lot of that has changed. I should probably get I should probably at least learn more about the Halo universe. I've never really got into it, in part because of my extreme bias towards consoles, and I always associated Halo with Xbox. And well, sort of, yeah. I have good news for you. Um, every game except Halo Five, I believe. I don't know why they still haven't put Halo 5 on, um, is on PC, on Steam. You mm. can get it. Okay. Something to consider. I'll, I'll have a look-see. Uh, mm -hmm. But what would you say the, the, the major appeal of, of the Halo series or the Halo universe is? So, um, again, I just I, I like the premise that your humanity, you've been, basically, you're at the game, the first game basically starts at like the tail end of the war. It's like a 30-year long war with an basically religious alien cult that concluded that humans are a blight on the galaxy and thus they're on a mm. genocidal campaign to wipe out humanity and you're basically on your last leg trying to find an edge against the covenant to end the war and it's and then there's you know games like halo 4 that kind of show you what what the world looks like after that is over and of course you know if you if you're a reader you want to read the books and all that stuff it really does a lot of world building it's it's very rich. I would argue there's more lore in the Halo universe than there is in the Mass Effect universe. Oh, probably. Yeah, I don't yeah. doubt that. Like, yeah. like it's 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 a lot of fun. Like if you like story, you like world building. That's what you like. Like the first game is all about the Master Chief. The second game, you're kind of getting more insight into what the Covenant's all about. In the mm -hmm. third game, you're finishing the fight. And then you know there's Halo Reach, Halo Three ODST, and stuff like this. It it's a good time. It's a good time. It's just, you know, it's something that, you know, it's not like 
codex entries like Mass Effect. It's not like that. But again, you're going to you're going to get lost in the world. You're going to get lost in it. Definitely something worth considering. I mean, I heard a lot about it. I had my certain, you know, biases, whatever. But uh, yeah, I'll definitely I'll definitely consider that. Especially but, since, like a campaign, it can it can take you a lot less time to beat a campaign for one of these games than say Mass Effect. So you know, time investment is a lot less as well. Yeah, tell me about. It. <laughs> yeah, I play games that are that take arguably too long. So yeah. Yeah, but the world still the world of the game still hits you like in mm-hmm. a similar fashion. And okay. by the time you're done playing across all the games, you know, you're going to have the ones you like. You're going to have the ones you don't like. You know, the fan base of Halo is just as, you know, divisive as um, as Mass Effect is like, oh, you know, before 343 Studios took over, those were the good old days. You're going to find no matter what franchise you get into, there's always going to be, quote unquote, the good old days. There's no escaping that. Yeah, obviously. Oh, that makes yeah. sense. I, I can't yeah. blame blame people for thinking that Correct. way or being that way. So that's absolutely fine. But, uh, yeah. Well, it's been a really good conversation. Uh, we're just about two hours. Um, you're going to probably be starting your day with your gazillion uh, gallons of coffee. This man, if you don't know, has uh, an, a truly impressive fortitude as it come, when it comes to caffeine. He just chugs these massively long cups. They're like, I don't know how long they are, but they, they seem very large. And you have, you're a actually, giant, but actually, by your... You know, uh, yeah. so it's, they must be really, really big and, uh, seemingly with no effect on you amazingly. Uh, so that's, uh, I miss coffee, I have to say, but, uh, as you get older, whatever, uh, particular curse or you might have, you just end up having to renounce and forsake certain things. It's just the, the way of things, unfortunately. So I will, yeah. uh, I miss coffee, but, uh, just very, very impressive coffee intake. I've, I've never seen its like before. Um, but, uh, so if you don't know Pete's channel, I'll be linking in the, in the description box. I mean, you should definitely go sub. I mean, really, really thorough videos. The guy has a whiteboard. Who has a whiteboard? Meticulously, uh, written out. Th- I mean, a very nice, uh, I guess, pen- penmanship, markermanship. I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, very, very thoughtful videos. Guy who thinks, well, I really... Probably one of my favorite channels uh, in the Manosphere, and, and really in YouTube in general. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time, believe it or not, watching or listening to YouTube videos. But one thing I do, to have to admit, I do convert to MP3 most of the time for my walks, is I will listen to uh, Pete's uh, videos fairly religiously. I'm a bit behind right now, but um, yeah, there's uh, they're just really, really nice quality, and uh, all, all coming uh, from the heart. So if you've not yet subbed, do so. It's a really great channel. And it's both been both an honor and privilege to have conversed with him today. Yep, the feeling is mutual, Stardust. It was really great to be here. So thanks so much for having me. It was no, great. my privilege. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.